sermon title for today is Extreme Generosity. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This sermon has two parts, extreme generosity, when the Lord, our God, was planning for us to be saved. And the another one is when the women, woman with the alabaster jar poured it on Jesus' head. And uh, it's a lot of scriptures that the Lord present before the one that we are studying today. Where scriptures were said that the Lord was going to be crucified and was going to be resurrected at the third day. We are going to see now that in Matthew 16, 21, the Lord is talking about what was going to happen later on. And for all of us, it's important to know how the disciples later on act like they didn't know nothing about it. This extreme generosity of the Lord, even now that so long ago, 2,000 ago, is still here with us. We are victorious because he gave us victory. And that's the most important thing that we have in Christ when we are Christians is because we follow him, because we love him, and because we want to do exactly what he's calling us to, that, to do, to love others, to love our neighbors. It is so beautiful. It's an extreme generosity from the Lord Almighty in his plan of redemption. And still, the disciples didn't get it. I'm just waiting for our scriptures to show up. <laughs> Here is the first prediction. And it is in Matthew 16, 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. Now, the second prediction is in Matthew 17, chap verses 22 and 23. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. Now the third prediction is in Matthew 20 from 18 to 19. We are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Now we have Matthew, that is the one that we are studying today, that is in verse 20, 
chapter 26, verse 2. You know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. The embedded and sovereign action of God in complicated behavior begins to emerge as this, as this reiteration of the passion is compared with those earlier statements. Notice first, of all what is left out of this declaration of the passion, while those previous passion predictions mention not only the suffering that is coming, but also the resurrection after three days. This one states resolutely, focus on the passion. No quick and easy passing over brutal reality of the human action of crucifixion is tolerated. If God is going to be discerned in this passion, it will be not because it is a pretend suffering promptly surpassed by a real resurrection. In anticipation of the consequence of the consequent creedal formulation of the church, Matthew is insisting that Jesus will be crucified, dead, and buried. Twisted, tormenting human deeds will have undeniably anguished consequences for Jesus. The religious authorities believe that they are in charge of Jesus' fate, but it is God's will that govern the course of events. It's God who is, who plan already, and he is in charge. They will arrest Jesus, the savior of the world, the one who gives freedom and deliverance on Passover, the day celebrating freedom and salvation. Against their best conspirational plan, they arrest Jesus, not when they think wisest, but when in, when in the providence and mercy of God, his hour has come. They thought their plan was smart, intelligent. No was the plan of God for our redemption in the suffering of Jesus and in all things works a redemptive purpose that desires the well-being of all that God has made. The next event in this chapter is when Jesus is anointed at Bethany. While Jesus was in Bethany, two miles east of Jerusalem, in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar and very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head and he was reclining at the table. The anointing itself occurs amid a number of ironies. The unnamed woman and her extravagant devotion, according to Jesus, will be remembered down the corridors of time and throughout the world. Yet, we cannot recall her by name. The perfume she pours over Jesus' head is of incalculable price. But Judas' betrayal can be counted out in 30 silver coins. Judas can be bought with a measured price. Jesus' messianic anointing cannot be reduced to any known sum. 
The woman anointed Jesus' body for burial while he is alive, whose Matthew's audience will understand foreshadows a burial so anxiously hurried there will be no time for ritual preparation. We all know. I am going to ask you to take your purple paper resembling an alabaster jar in your right hand and keep it with you the rest of the sermon. I will tell you tell you later on what we are going to, to do with it. Smell it. We are trying to remember that perfume that that woman poured out in Jesus' head. As I reread the accounts of this woman, But this woman's extravagant but misunderstood devotion and meditate on the story, I felt the Holy Spirit working in my heart. Please, let the Holy Spirit begin working in your heart while you hold your alabaster jar and show you some important things this morning. He, he, cho he showed me some important truth about this woman's act that apply to believers today. The Holy Spirit will let you know in your heart what is in your alabaster jar? What this woman did was a great act of love. She gave her best a gift of great quality, quantity, and cost. It was also an act of deep humility and reverence. It was a gift of extreme generosity. After pouring out the perfume, she prepared to anoint Jesus' head and losing the braids of her hair in those days a mark of unusual self-abandonment. The woman was already committed to Jesus and didn't have to lavish her perfume on him to prove her love. She could, have held, she could have held back and keep, kept it for herself. She could have remained a follower and lover of Jesus and still could have spent eternity with him in heaven. But imagine what she could have given up by holding onto her earthly treasure. She would have missed the opportunity to bless our Lord and to inspire others to, who came after her to give their all for him. Are we as selfless and devoted as this woman? Are we willing to give up that which is precious to us to not only honor God, but also be an example to those around us. Jesus and the other disciples criticized her, but she didn't care. She didn't apologize or express regret for her actions. Even when Judas pointed out that the perfume would have been sold to help the poor. When we become radical for Christ, willing to sacrifice ourselves and our possessions for him, even those close to him may not understand. 
as the disciples didn't understand. They might be threatened by our gift. They might become jealous or they might react in condescending religious way as Judas did. How will we respond? We will pull back. Will we regret our extravagance or begin to doubt the value of it? The woman had insight about the significance of her act. Somehow she sensed Jesus' impending death. Even though his disciples, whom he had told of his death and resurrection, didn't seem to get it. They didn't get it. Some were concerned about an earthly kingdom. Others brazenly asked to sit as his right or his left hand in heaven. But she adored him. And in her spirit, she understood and performed this tremendous act of love to prepare his body for burial. As a result, Jesus defended her from the harsh criticism that came her way. Not only that, but he said she would become famous. How ironic. By pouring her all on the master and giving him her most costly treasure, she set herself up to be remembered forever. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Do we understand the true purpose of our relationship with Jesus? Or are we using as a means to an end? Are we looking for power, position of other benefits? Or do we find fulfillment in simply loving and obeying him? In reflecting in this woman's example, I was prompted to ask myself a pointed question. What is in my alabaster jar? And what am I going to do with it? I began to search my heart to see if there was anything hidden there that I wanted to treasure myself. Would I be willing to pour it out on him? I discovered one thing in my jar that I was holding back and found that I struggled to relinquish this to him, even though I love him dearly and want to pursue him with all my heart. What about you? What precious perfume is lacked inside your heart that could be lavished on our Lord? The little treasures you and I struggle to grasp, may hold, may hold back opportunities to worship him with extravagant praise, releasing ministry and service to him that will bless all those around us. What is in your alabaster jar? And what are you going to do with it? What gift of extreme generosity would you like to give to your Savior? Now, 
Please put your right hand over your heart and close your eyes. I am going to give you a moment of silence and let the Holy Spirit talk to you and let you know what is in your alabaster jar that you need to pour it out on him. We all are created on the image of God. I'm going to ask you now, please stand up and pair up and give your alabaster jar to your neighbor as you were giving it to Jesus. And I am going to ask you, put the alabaster jar that you have received from your brother or sister in your altar where you do your daily devotion and pray for the sister or brother that gave you his or her alabaster jar. Let's remember that woman that poor put it out on Jesus' head and remember to put it in your brother or sister as an example of that woman and as, as an example of our love and our extravagant generosity. Let's pray. Precious and loving God, thank you, Father, for this congregation, Lord, full of love for you. Now, Lord, let them to pray for the brother or sister that they had in their hands and bring blessing to the family of that person, Lord, to give victory as you give us victory, O oh Lord, every single day. Thank you for your love, Almighty God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.